Hi everyone, my name is Renata. I'm a PhD student at the Corvinus University of Budapest in Hungary. And generally I research uh, populism, understood as communication or discourse, so the non-ideological dimension of it. And today what I've brought here is basically a subtopic of it, as the title of my presentation is The Road to the Populist Heartland is Paved with Food. So we're going to talk about um, populist communication with regards uh, to how they represent food and how and what they try to communicate with that. My overall general research question is how do populist political actors use the concept of food in their communication and then how is this discourse, how can it be recontextualized, so how can it appear across actors at different points in time or at different locations. In this specific case, I am going to conduct a case study in Hungary, which is still in progress. So what you will uh, see today is basically a, a pilot case study, which will be developed further uh, during the course of the next few months. But this analysis will mainly uh, focus on visual representation, mainly social media, which is an extremely important element of contemporary populist communication. And my hypothesis is that populist political actors use the portrayal of food, especially in their social media, as a tactic to present their ordinary dance, puritanity, and emphasize the importance of nationality via the choice of food. So what food they choose to represent in their communication. As I have already mentioned it, I usually focus on the non-ideological dimension of populism. So I understand it uh, basically as a, as, a, as a communicative or discursive phenomenon, as a style or tool of politics, a strategy or a political narrative, uh, or a political performance, a particular mode of political expression. I have listed a few authors here. Um, these are basically my favorite interpretations of populism, but uh, of course there are many others even within this non-ideological framework. So, um, as I argue, in the third and fourth wave of political communication and within the mediatized postmodern environment, the communicative aspects of politics have come forward, such as image or rhetoric, pushing political ideologies and party programs to the side. This process has eventually led to the aesthetic transformation of the public sphere, which of course has its effects on representative democracy as well. This era is uh, foremost characterized by the appearance of media logic, mediatization 2.0, so the appearance of bidirectional communication within the social media, most prominently Facebook or uh, Instagram, maybe Twitter, and the, the parallel personalization and spectacularization of politics. Accordingly, personalized leadership has become central in most of our contemporary dem democracies and is increasingly characterized by strong male leaders who have emphasized their masculinity. A prominent and generally well-known example for this is uh, Vladimir Putin, as you can see on the picture that I chose. Uh, he often distributes images of himself where he's in the middle of many activities, such as fishing, hunting, or riding a horse in military clothing. This has been referred to as muscular macho populism by Smith and Higgins, highlighting how this is an important element of contemporary populist leadership. The personalization of politics goes hand in hand with celebrity politics, meaning that the boundaries between politicians and celebrities is getting incredibly blurry. Celebrities may appear in politics, and they often do so, while politicians use celebrity tactics for self-representation to increase their popularity. Trivialization of politics and public issues and the tabloidization of political content are also characteristics of this era. Identity seems uh, to be a dominating concept. It seems to dominate politics and political discourse nowadays, and it must be pointed out that visual discourse on social media is also relevant in this case. It is through identity discourse and the selective construction of narratives that feelings of nostalgia emerge, which contributes to the emergence of symbolic boundaries through narratives, telling us who we are and how we are different from the others, so it helps to um, draw up the boundary between an us and a them, which is often, not often, always, the basis of populist politics. Now to provide an idea about the wider political context, 
wider local political context, I will quickly introduce current Hungarian politics as much as I can within this time frame. The Prime Minister of Hungary is Viktor Orban, very well known nowadays in politics. Uh, he has been the Prime Minister ever since 2010, however, he has also been the PM between 1998 and 2002. He is also the President of Fidesz ever since its founding in 1988, which originally, which might be surprising, but it has been a liberal student activist movement and it has gradually shifted into a national conservative right-wing party. So here, in this case, a serious discursive shift has taken place, at least uh, regarding their communication. The party has super majorities since 2010, which has allowed them to implement some extraordinary policies. For example, maybe the most prominent example of this would be that they have changed the constitution of Hungary according to their world view. So they have uh, emphasized even within that traditionalist, conservative, family values, Christian values. It is fair to argue that Orban, ever since he gave a memorable speech at the end of communism at the reburial of Imre Noy, is a personal dominant uh, charismatic leader with a significant number of followers on Facebook, over 1 million, where he is fairly active. With regards to their communication, Fidesz is highly critical of the European Union and generally of European or Western uh, liberal values. Instead of these, they emphasize Christian and conservative values and follow a nationalist discourse, especially since the appearance of Jobbik in 2010, which is a far-right party who has threatened the position of Fidesz. Thus, Fidesz has implemented some of their discourse into their own. Therefore, their communication has become increasingly nationalistic and xenophobic. Their relationship, Fidesz's relationship with the EU and Brussels, ha revolves around the narrative of a constant freedom fight. And similarly to other populist political actors, they try to emphasize uh, ordinariness. And generally, we can argue that they follow a traditionalist and often sexist discourse, as in the case when the Prime Minister himself said that he does not deal with uh, women's issues. Here I would like to say a few words about the general communication of Fidesz and not so much about the communication of Viktor Orban himself. In the first poster, what it says is that the three pillars of our policy, family, nation and Christian freedom, this I have mentioned before, this is basically what um, Fidesz builds on discursively. The second uh, two pictures, so these two were billboards that were put up uh, during the immigrant crisis of 2015. This was after Fidesz has implemented some of the discursive strategies of Yobi. The first billboard says we have a bigger economic growth than the EU and the second one states that we do not want illegal migrants. Both of these very much fit within the general anti-EU, anti-European nationalist discourse that Fidesz follows. However, jumping to our actual empirical material, I brought uh, four pictures to serve as the basis of this presentation. In the first case, you can see Viktor Orban on the 1st of April in 2018 cooking ham. But cooking uh, not just simple ham, but cooking Eastern ham, for Eastern, outside, in a very traditional way. So, with this one thing, he has represented uh, several different discourses, the Christian discourse, nationalist discourse, traditionalist uh, discourse, and even the masculine discourse. This uh, originally is a video that he posted himself on his uh, Facebook and you can watch it yourself. It's also available in YouTube. The second picture, on the second picture you can see Janos Kadar. He was a Hungarian socialist leader from 1956 to 1988 and also the general secretary of the Hungarian Socialist Workers Party. So he's not so much a populist. But what I want to talk about here is more not his discourse, but the discourse about him. So what I refer to here is the general discourse of how people spoke about him and his simple eating habits, not per se to this picture or to the things he said about himself. On this image, 
which only serves as an example of the discourse, he is eating some kind of simple food. He was often represented as such and was famous for his assumed Puritanism. There are many stories, or we can say maybe legends, about his favorite food, which is most commonly claimed to be potato soup, a very cheap and traditional uh, Hungarian food, which is often generally eaten by the working class. Resonating then with the socialist discourse and now, interestingly, with the nationalist and populist discourse. Another interesting point here is that Orban is actually often compared to Kandar and our contemporary political reality in Hungary is often compared to the one back then in the socialist era. So this comparison between them already exists. On the third picture, you can see a Facebook post of Orban who shared his pickled cucumber last summer in the making. It got very big media attention as something weird and funny. Pickled cucumber is something overly typical in Hungary to be made in the summer, but as you need to leave it on the sun directly, it is less typical in the city where the liberal intellectuals live. The picture targets and resonates with the countryside people. As a very wide interpretation of it, pickled cucumber can be understood as a national symbol, even. The third picture is um, the Facebook post of Szilard Német, who is a Fidesz MP, whose main task, task is, unofficially, to represent the archetype of the traditionalist Hungarian man via the dimension of food. His whole communication is filled with pictures of him eating traditional meat dishes, Meat has to be emphasized because it plays a very important role, and especially pork meat. In a sense, uh, he follows an anti-vegan discourse where veganism is connected to Western liberalism in a pejorative way. Once, for example, he argued that liberals don't eat pork. And we can also uh, point out that generally the representation of, uh, of meat um, signals masculinity. By eating meat, these political actors represent themselves as uh, not only traditionalist, not only nationalist, because the choices they make, but also as a very masculine. And now some further examples for the function that Szilard Német fulfills, again unofficially. In the first two cases, you can see posts shared by him on Facebook where pictures that were shared as a Facebook post. In the first case, he's a cooking stew. So again, we are faced with a meat dish, something very traditional, very, very Hungarian, very typical in the countryside. And moreover, another interesting element on this picture is the colors of his clothing. You can see that uh, he wears green, red, and there you can see some white, which are the colors of the Hungarian national flag. And on the second post, he actually distributed uh, food accordingly, again, red, white, and green. On the third picture, I brought you an example of his articles, because actually he had a weekly column for recipes in a Fidesz-related media outlet, where every weekend he would share a recipe. Uh, this one is a recipe specifically for a, a Sunday lunch, and it even starts with saying that uh, it is good to live in a family. The starting point of this analysis, or the primary text, in this case, this case video, had been uh, Orban Cooking Ham, a uh, video shared on Facebook in 2018, Eastern, as I have mentioned. In this case, what we could see is a symbolic visual representation, where the act of speech has been almost entirely irrelevant. And uh, the discourses that we could identify in this video were nationalist, traditionalist, Christian, and conservative. The top boy identified had been food or gastronomy, ordinariness, puritanism, identity, values, national culture, and religious heritage. And the mode of discourse is mainly visual. The discursive strategies that could be identified were the following. First of all, um, within the category of positive self-representation, reference or nomination, which refers to a membership categorization, a definition of us and identity formation, who we are, what are our, our values, and also perspectivation or involvement, referring to 
and expressing involvement, emphasizing um, uh, someone's own point of view. In this case, uh, his uh, wider world view by the by the discourses that he chose to represent in the video. Moving on to the possible recontextualization of our primary video about Orban cooking ham. Uh, and for first of all, I want to mention that recontextualization refers to how a discourse can appear in different contexts, so either in different locations or at different times. So I have a brought three examples for this presentation. The first one, as I have already demonstrated, is the general communication of Szilard Neyman. The second one is the discourse about Janusz Kandar, how people spoke about him, about his assumed Puritanism and Puritan eating habits. And the third one is about the pickled cucumbers made by Urban and shared on Facebook last summer. I have identified the discourses relating to them. As we can see, uh, basically, uh, the only interesting thing is that the second one is only a socialist discourse. I couldn't find any nationalist, traditionalist, or conservativist elements about it. Uh, as to the topics, uh, we can see that everything is about food. However, what is interesting is that... Uh, the goal of political actors by sharing these posts, videos, pictures is to emphasize their identity. However, in socialism, it was not about not so much about identity but about unity, not about who we are, but that we are all the same. And as to discursive strategies, basically everywhere I could identify the same reference or nomination, perspectivation, involvement, except for the first case where I could also. Um, identify argumentation based on the text of the post and not on the, this picture or the general communication of uh, Szilard Nemet. Uh, a striking difference is that the religious discourse identified in the Facebook uh, video about Orban cooking ham was not present in any of the other cases. As we could see in this case, a broader phenomenon, so populism, is recontextualized locally. So what we can observe is a micro-level representation of a global change. This is the difference between a discursive change and a discursive shift. This highlights the possible strategic nature of recontextualization, especially in the case of Szilard Nemet, who, as I have said, basically primarily fulfills this role of identity formation by, represent, by the representation of food. And an interesting finding is that uh, the socialist discourse is fairly similar to populist discourse regarding its top boy of ordinariness and puritanism. And this is especially interesting in the case of Hungary, where Fidesz uh, most often, or the believers of Fidesz at least, most often contrasted to socialism. Overall, we can argue that in the mediatized postmodern era, symbolic identity presentation via mainly social media becomes increasingly important and that future research should compare how this relates to contemporary non-populist actors. Thank you for the attention.